Okay, so we have been discussing the action principle for general relativity and so last time we finally wrote down the Einstein Hilbert action which was uh, we have a manifold on which we have the natural volume form E g okay, where E g is in some coordinate system it looks like this dx1 to dxn and it was very simply the Ricci scalar which is a function of the metric. Okay. And when we took the variation of this action with respect to a family of metrics G which depend on some parameter lambda and we extremize the action. So, we said ds by d lambda to 0. ds by d lambda is equal to delta s delta uh, g mu nu, uh, let me write it like this, delta g mu nu times E where we wrote this, okay. So, E g is related to another volume form E, but this volume form E does not depend on the metric, okay. And so, when you do that, okay, the variation of the action setting that to 0 is equivalent to demanding that this quantity delta s delta g mu nu is 0, okay. This is the equation of motion. And in the last class what we showed is that this variation, okay, this delta s delta g mu nu has two parts to it. There is one part which was simply minus square root g r mu nu minus half uh, g mu nu times r, okay. And there was another part, yeah, okay. So, this sorry, this other part, let me just write this, okay. So, this times delta g mu nu. Okay, or this quantity in here uh, is actually two parts. Okay, there's one part which is depends on the variation of g mu nu. Okay, maybe it's better to call this delta s. Okay, and I won't write uh, write it like this. Okay, so our variation of the action wasn't exactly like this because there was also some part which depended on delta of the Christoffel symbols. Okay, delta gamma mu nu rho. So, it wasn't exactly like this. So, the second part that we had, okay, was written as minus square root g oh, sorry, this is upper mu nu del rho. So, this was a, a current density, okay, where this current density j rho was equal to um, delta gamma kappa, so delta gamma rho alpha beta g alpha beta minus g um, alpha rho delta gamma um, Okay. So, this was uh, 0 and so this was a total divergence, okay. And what we argued last time, okay, was that when you consider this integration, okay, over the volume form, this, this part of the, of the integral is del rho j rho times square root minus g times e, okay, which is e g. Okay. So, there is a part of delta s which involves this kind of surface term. Uh, by the generalized uh, Stokes theorem, okay, which is effectively Gauss's law, this can be written as an integral over the boundary of m 
of some normal vector mu j mu okay where I integrate over a volume form which is inherited from this okay but it is a, a volume form on the boundary of m okay it is not a volume form on the manifold it is a volume form on the boundary of m and the orientation of this there is a natural sense in which you define this orientation okay and then there is some particular choice uh, choice for these normal vectors which I, I did not discuss in detail and maybe we will take it up in the discussion section okay. So, so this is the uh, the boundary term okay and this boundary term j mu okay depends on the derivatives delta gamma okay. Now, these derivatives delta gamma depend on the derivatives of delta g okay that is they depend on the variation of uh, or on the rate of change of the variation of the matrix okay on the boundary. At, so, this is now evaluated on the boundary on partial m. And so, it depends on the derivatives of delta g on the boundary okay. So, what that means is we started with a manifold m, this was our boundary of m okay and we are fixing the metric on the boundary okay. So, this is g on partial m which we call h okay. This metric on the boundary is fixed okay, we are fixing the boundary metric. So, when we vary the metric we are only varying the metric in the interior region, we are not varying the metric on the boundary. So, in the interior we are changing delta g, but the boundary condition on delta g is that on the boundary delta g is 0 okay. So, so this is like what we call Dirichlet boundary conditions right, where we fix g on the bound delta g on the boundary by saying that g is fixed on the boundary, but we are not varying, uh, but on the other hand we are not fixing del g the gradient of g at the boundary okay. So, we are not fixing del g on the boundary which means the derivative of delta g is not fixed okay. Since so sorry since we have not fixed delta g on the boundary we have only fixed g on the boundary okay. This would this would correspond to Neumann boundary conditions okay. Since we are imposing Dirichlet boundary conditions we are not fixing delta g on the boundary we are only fixing g on the boundary okay. And so, the derivative okay. So, the change sorry not this, but the change in delta g okay which is related to delta of the change in g this is not 0 on the boundary okay. Which means that we cannot set this boundary term to 0 okay as, as we would normally do okay and, uh, and and so since this term is not 0 the equation of motion is not just that g mu nu is 0, but there is also this boundary term that has to be taken into account. Okay. Last time we just hand waved and said okay let us ignore this term okay. But today I will just tell you the prescription to ensure that this term goes away okay. We want to ensure that that term goes away yeah. That boundary condition yeah. specifically 3. This boundary condition? No those on that volume you said no delta G is constant h and delta G is equal to. G is fixed on the boundary uh. okay. But delta g is sorry, but del g is not fixed on the boundary. Okay. We are using that condition. This is the condition. This is the boundary condition. It's Dirichlet yeah. boundary conditions. Like, for example, when you solve in electrodynamics and you have a scalar potential, right? You fix phi on the boundary. Mm. Okay. This is fixed. But you're not fixing the derivative of phi. Okay, over here. Okay. okay. So you allow for any gradient. Okay, but you are fixing the boundary phi. Hmm. That is different from fixing the derivative of phi on the boundary which is uh, Neumann boundary conditions and allowing phi to vary on the boundary okay. Which means so because of this condition we are setting delta g the variation of g on the boundary to 0, but we are not setting the variation of delta del g on the boundary to 0 okay. This is not 0 and uh, what I am arguing is that this variation is related to the rate of change del of delta g okay and therefore this is this is not set to 0 okay on the boundary okay which means that this boundary term this current j j on the boundary okay is not 0 because this delta gamma will depend on the variation of g exist this there. is not the second order derivative of g okay so g is a metric mm -hmm. okay the g is some point at which you are evaluating the action 
we're considering a variation by adding to it another metric delta g. Mm. Okay. So this is a change. So now we got a new metric. Okay. We only look at the change in the metric delta g, and now we consider the gradient of the change. That is, we're looking. So if this is a two form, okay, or uh, or a zero two tensor, the derivative of g is a zero three tensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this delta is not the same as that del. Okay, okay. These are different things. Yeah, so you're asking about this equation. When is this true? Uh, if I think about the interior, then I have my original G. Ah, okay, yeah. So, okay, so let's call G prime as this. Okay, G prime is G plus delta G. So, I have a derivative of G prime. Okay, so delta, uh, the change in delta G is by definition delta of G prime minus delta of G, del of G. And this is nothing but del of G plus delta G minus delta G. So this is delta of delta G. Sorry, nabla of delta G. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't call everything delta. Okay, this is, gr uh, nabla is the derivative. Metric tens are always zero. Uh, Torsion free. Yeah. But I think we already made the choice. Sir. I uh, no, okay. So let me explain this clearly. Delta G is indeed zero if you choose delta to be the metric compatible connection. But delta is a, der this del, sorry, this nabla is a derivative that is compatible with the metric G, okay? It's not compatible with the metric G prime, okay? That is del of G is zero, okay? Because this connection is chosen based on what the metric G is. But del, the same derivative, when I use it on G prime, will not be zero, okay? When I act on G prime, it will, uh, again on the part which is just G, it will be zero but on the part which is delta G, okay, it will give you this. So, of course, trivially this is zero and this is zero, okay. But even if these were not metric compatible connections, okay, this would still be derivative of delta G. Sir, yeah. that isn't that condition uh, valid for partial derivatives and not the covariant derivatives? This one? Yeah, I mean, if it's a partial, then we can take it out. But no, no, but this argument, okay, works uh, regardless, okay, because this derivative, this affine connection satisfies a linearity property, okay? That is uh, del of A plus B is equal to del A plus del B. Nabla of A is nabla of A plus nabla of B. Okay, so it's linear, right? So it's true even for this affine connection. In fact, you should we're not even referencing any coordinate system. So partial derivatives are a reference to a particular coordinate system. What we're talking about is coordinate system independent. Okay. So the only thing that is coordinate system independent is this connection. Okay. The connection is, is what we should think of as the real derivative of it. Okay. So the way we get around this, okay, or the way we get rid of that boundary term is, uh, I'm going to write the prescription for how we get rid of it, but I won't prove this okay, is that we add a modification to the Einstein-Hilbert action. So we say that the, the action for gravity is the Einstein-Hilbert action plus a correction, okay, and this correction is called, is, is a boundary action, which is called the Gibbons-Hawking-York uh, boundary term. And this Gibbons Hawking York boundary term is a boundary value action. That is, it's an action where on the boundary of M, okay, it uses the inherited metric EG twiddle, okay, uh, that is this one over here, which uh, remember since we're fixing the boundary metric G on partial M to be H, okay, I can write it also as E twiddle of H, okay, where H is the boundary metric. Okay, 
So I'll write it as e twiddle h. There is a sense in which the orientation of e twiddle h is inherited from the original orientation of e of g. Okay. So this is a boundary form, boundary volume form. Okay, and then there is a factor of minus 2 times k, okay, and I'll explain what this k is. So k is uh, related to g, g mu nu, k mu nu, and this tensor k mu nu is called the surface gravity tensor. We'll discuss more in detail about what the surface gravity is and its physical interpretation later. But right now, I'll just write down the definition of this uh, k mu nu. This is the lead derivative, or half the lead derivative along the normal vector to this boundary, okay, of uh, of g. Okay. which can be shown, okay, and sorry, and this is again evaluated on the boundary, okay, so it really depends on h rather than on g, okay, and you can show that this is equal to uh, h mu uh, So this will be a little homework problem, okay, again to work out. Okay, this is the definition of what this tensor k is, okay, it's related to the lead derivative of g, g uh, where the lead derivative is taken where n is the normal to partial m, okay. So this k is the trace of k mu nu, which is the surface gravity tensor, okay, and that gives us a, some quantity which is evaluated on the boundary, okay, it's a scalar on the boundary. Okay. So I'm not proving that this is the surface term, but the claim is now that when I take, okay, so when I vary the action with respect to this lambda, okay, I'll get two terms. One is a variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action with respect to lambda, and I'll get a variation of the boundary action. with respect to lambda, okay. And uh, the boundary action also depends on g, okay. So the boundary action also depends on g. And the claim is when I vary the boundary action with respect to g, okay, the variation of this boundary action with respect to g exactly cancels this surface term which arises in the variation of the Einstein-Hilbert action, okay, with respect to g, okay. So these two variations together, okay, lead to the cancellation of that boundary, uh, that boundary term. And so what we're left over with, okay, is if I take this full action, okay, including this boundary term, okay, including this boundary term, that's when we get uh, the right equations of motion. So ds g d lambda equals zero. This will just imply, now the boundary terms are all gone. And so this will just imply that the Einstein tensor g mu nu is zero, okay? Subject to the boundary conditions that g mu nu or g is equal, restricted to the boundary is h, okay? So now I'm really solving this boundary value problem, okay, of finding a metric where I fix the boundary value metric, okay, and I'm setting the Einstein tensor to zero, okay? So the Dirichlet problem has a well-defined correction that you need to add as a boundary term, okay? This doesn't always show up. In most of the actions that we're used to, this doesn't always show up. And the reason it doesn't always show up is that the variation of any action that we typically take typically doesn't contain variations like uh, 
the change in delta phi, okay, or sorry, the derivative of uh, delta phi, okay. Typically, we do not have these kind of terms in our actions, okay, where, where these are on evaluated on the boundary. These kind of terms never show up when we consider variations of actions typically. But in, if you just take the Einstein Hilbert action, you do get terms like this, and you need to cancel them with some kind of boundary term. Uh, there are other boundary terms or b other boundary actions that you need to choose if you have Neumann boundary conditions. Um, uh, also this, uh, I should mention another caveat, okay. So one is this only works for Dirichlet boundary conditions, okay. It does not work for Neumann boundary conditions. Uh, you have to, so there are some papers which I, which I saw re which are as recent as 2018, right, which try to give, construct such a boundary action for uh, Neumann boundary conditions. The other thing is that this Gibbons Hawking York term, okay, this only works when the boundary partial M has normal vectors N which are either time like or space like. So what that means is, for example, if you think about Minkowski space, this is x, this is t, okay, we can choose all of Minkowski space to be our manifold or what we can do is we can take a partial region of Minkowski space and specify the boundary metric, okay. And for example, then what we are doing is we could construct a time slice, an initial time slice, okay, and say we are solving for the metric in this upper region and we specify the metric only at this initial region, okay. And then we try to find the metric above and then of course in, in vacuum, Einstein's equations should tell you that you have the flat metric, okay. But when we specify this initial surface, the initial surface that we are specifying has a normal vector which is partial partial t, okay. It is a time like normal vector. Similarly, I could have instead specified the boundary by choosing a boundary like this, okay, at x is equal to 0. Okay. And this boundary has a normal vector which is like this, it is partial partial x, okay. So now the normal vector is space like. But I could have also chosen a surface when my boundary is this, okay, and I am solving for the metric let us say on one side of this, okay. But in this case the boundary is uh, this kind of vector, okay, and this is a null vector. When you have a null vector, sorry, uh, and sorry, the, I should really talk about the normal to this, which is partial partial t minus partial partial x, okay. Now the boundary normal vector is a null vector, okay. A and in particular what that means is that n mu n mu is 0, okay. And so this Gibbons Hawking York boundary term fails for such cases when you choose your boundary to be a null surface. Okay. This is also important when I choose the boundary, for example, to be the event horizon of a black hole because the event horizon of the black hole is also a null surface, okay. So that's, that's an important uh, caveat, okay. So these are the two conditions under which you can choose this Gibbons Hawking York uh, boundary term. Yeah. So when we took the lead derivative, shouldn't the mu nu be symmetrized? Shouldn't uh, mu nu be symmetrized? Yeah, so okay, I guess this this k mu nu is symmetric, but it's hard to see the symmetry. No, the, in there, there should be another term after calculating the lead derivative where mu nu are switched. Yeah, what I'm saying is that this term, which you've written, mm -hmm. is secretly symmetric in mu nu, okay. But when we calculate the lead derivative, we get two terms, right? One with two terms with mu nu symmetrized. Two terms with mu nu symmetrized. Um, so the other term will have h nu rho and del mu n rho. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. So what I will argue is that this term, okay, uh, when I multiply by dx nu, dx nu is the same as 
at new rho del mu n rho dx mu dx mu. Okay. So this term is secretly symmetric already. But just bare lead derivative it should have another term, right? Bare lead derivative? Like without multiplying by the volume form uh, after multiplying by the volume form we can this see. This is not the volume form, sorry. This is the metric. So mm. just calculating the metric by just calculating the lead derivative we should have two terms, but as you are saying after multiplying by the volume form they are secretly just one term, right? After multiplying by the volume form on E H. Mm. Um, but by just calculating the lead derivative we should get two terms right. I do not think this, so this whole thing is a scalar, so it has nothing to do with the volume form that we are using. No, I am saying just uh, if I calculate the lead derivative. This lead derivative. So we'll it have should have another term. Yeah. With mu nu switched. Yes, so what I am saying is, let us suppose we have these two terms, hmm. okay. What I am saying is that this term is actually equal to this term. But where did we get those dx mu and dx Sorry? Uh, the dx mu, dx nu, where did we get? Oh, so sorry. So this is actually a tensor. So when I say this, uh, what I mean is k mu dx mu dx nu. Oh, okay. Then times this dx mu. And then it's. Sir? Yeah. Sir, so instead of like to, uh, introducing one new boundary action, can't we just get the Einstein equation just by using Neumann boundary condition? Okay. Yeah, so the question is, so supposing I had Neumann boundary conditions, okay, would we need this term at all? Do you need any boundary term at all? Uh, but if we like uh, from the beginning, beginning if we, if we assume that the variation in the derivative of the metric is zero, then we do not have to introduce this. Yeah, but okay. So, mm, yeah, so if you are saying if we assume um, this condition. right then this variation only contains such terms and therefore we can set uh, uh, or and the boundary term only contains such terms therefore these will all be set to zero with neumann boundary conditions and therefore for neumann boundary conditions we don't even need any correction term yeah on the face of it it seems okay yeah the only thing that i'm not sure of is um whether this condition makes sense. So this is the derivative that is compatible with G. So is setting this to 0 a sensible boundary condition? Yeah, suppose we fix derivative of G on the boundary. Okay, sorry, can not think of it off the top of my head. Let us uh, note it down and let us discuss it in the discussion section. Okay, whether we need any boundary term at all for normal boundary conditions, yeah. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the boundary can have normal vectors which are either time like or space like, it cannot share, you know, both time like and space like, or can it just not have null like and can share, you know, some time like, some space like? Yeah, so, okay, so you can have boundaries which are, let us say, suppose in Minkowski space again, I choose a boundary like this. So it is space like here uh, or the, the normal vector is time like and here the normal vector is space like. So locally the normal vector will be either space like or time like, okay. I, in principle similarly you can even have a normal vector which is also null, okay. So if I choose the interior of this as the region I want to solve for, I can have normal vectors which are null uh, on the surface. So when I say that it has normal vectors which are time like or space like the normal vectors are nowhere null, okay, that is the statement. If they are null anywhere, then this boundary term will fail. Oh, actually, you know, uh, Ramat, now that you ask, I'm thinking about this, uh, the boundary has to be smooth, okay, which means the normal vectors will also be smooth. So something like this does not actually work because the normal vector is, has to, there is no way a normal vector can smoothly transition to from null to space like to null or time like to null or, or time like to space like even, right. 
So there is no way to choose boundary boundaries in a smooth way, right? Uh, this this will never happen. Okay, so now what we have is we have an Einstein action, uh, sorry, we have a total action, which is the gravitational action, which has two parts. It has the Einstein Hilbert action, which is, which is this, and you have the Gibbons Hawking York boundary term, okay, which all this, the only reason this is needed is to uh, satisfy the Dirichlet boundary condition so that the surface term here gets cancelled. So, boundary of M, sorry, uh, this is the square root of minus G, and this is uh, minus 2K. But in addition to just gravity, that is just having a metric field on your manifold, you can have other fields, okay, uh, scalar fields, vector fields, fermion fields, and so on. So let's take the example of a scalar field, okay. We'll take the example of a Klein-Gordon scalar field, okay. So these actions depend only on the metric. So this part is called the gravitational, uh, sorry, uh, this part is called the gravitational action, okay, which only depends on the metric. And then you have another part which depends on a scalar as well as the metric, okay. And now, so the total action depends on two fields. It depends not only on the metric, but it also depends on the scalar field phi, okay. And so we could take equations of motion when we construct ds by d lambda is zero. We can independently vary phi and we can independently vary g, okay. But together, okay, you're looking for an extremum of the action under both those very independent variations, okay. So in this case, what will happen is you'll get two equations of motion because uh, roughly speaking, the variation of the action delta s will have a term like this, okay, where I've cancelled out the Gibbons Hawking York term the surface term and now I also have delta s delta phi, okay. So for arbitrary variations delta g and arbitrary variations delta phi, I am assuming I am solving with uh, Neumann, uh, sorry, with Dirichlet boundary conditions, it must be true that this is separately 0 and this is separately 0, okay. So delta s delta g mu nu is 0 and delta s delta phi is 0, okay. These equations have to be simultaneously satisfied to extremize the action, okay. So we've already seen that when we take the variation of the action with respect to g mu nu, if we just look at the gravitational part, okay, then this would just give us g mu nu equal to 0, okay, and this would be equal to 0. But now we have this extra part which also depends on the metric, okay. So we have to vary this also with respect to the metric and it's the sum of the variation of these two terms with respect to g and also this with respect to g, okay, that will give us our full equations of motion. So I can write down directly what this extra piece will be, okay. So uh, this variation, okay, we've already seen is minus square root g, uh, g mu nu, okay. Uh, and the second term, okay, that is coming from here will be delta s delta g mu nu and these together will multiply, um, will multiply uh, delta g upper mu nu. 
okay, times uh, times the volume form. Sorry, just E, okay, not E. So this delta S delta G has two parts, where this delta S is the Klein-Gordon action. Okay, so this this is sometimes also called like uh, any other fields that you add, which are not the metric. Okay, are called matter fields. Okay, so it could be one scalar field, it could be multiple scalar fields, it could be fermions, anything else, okay, that you add. Those are typically called matter fields. So now our equation of motion is not just g mu nu is equal to zero, but rather g mu nu is equal to minus um, delta S uh, matter by delta g mu nu. 1 over square root minus g. Okay. So this is the Einstein equation that we get. We have to vary the matter action with respect to the metric, okay, and then we'll get this right hand side of Einstein's equations. Okay. And this is the thing that we identify with the stress energy tensor. So we call this the stress energy tensor T mu. gravitational stress energy tensor. Okay, and to be more precise, if we want to match the normalization convention, so we put an 8 pi over here, okay. And so by definition, what we're doing is, we're giving a definition of the stress energy tensor in terms of the variation of the matter action. Okay, so here we're actually providing a definition. So given a matter action, or given a matter Lagrangian, okay, you have a definite prescription now to get the right hand side of Einstein's equation. It's not just an arbitrary construction of what the stress energy tensor is, it follows from a particular Lagrangian, okay. So if you give me this action, I can construct for you a stress energy tensor, okay. So what we'll do is let's write down a specific action, okay, and we will compute two things. We'll compute the gravitational equation of motion which will be Einstein's equations with the stress energy tensor coming from the matter, okay, uh, the matter fields. And we will also construct delta S delta phi is equal to zero. That is, we'll construct the equation of motion for the scalar field. So what that means is I'll give you the form of this Klein-Gordon action. So this is a particular choice, okay. Uh, where does it come from? We don't know. We could choose this. We could choose something else, okay. This is a choice that we make for the Klein-Gordon action. Okay. Uh, by the way, I should point out that similarly, we should not think of the Einstein-Hilbert action or the Gibbons-Hawking-York action. These two actions, okay, are not something that you derive. This is something that has to be given to you. The way we derived it is by demanding that the equations of motion that follow from this, okay, quote unquote derived because we didn't, uh, uh, the reasoning is circular. We start with an action and the equations of motion that we get, we want it to be Einstein's equations. Why do we want Einstein's equations? Because we've seen that Einstein's equations are the thing that in the, in the uh, slow speed limit, Okay, a weak gravitational field limit is the thing that gives you Newton's laws. Moreover, these equations seem to explain classical strong gravitational fields also very well, okay. They explain things like black holes and so on. Are there possible corrections to this? Maybe, okay. If there are, they are weak, okay. We haven't yet discovered them. So in, if there are corrections to these equations, there could be corrections to the Einstein-Hilbert action, okay. There could be corrections to the Gibbons-Hawking-York term. 
But at the moment, this is our best understanding of what this action is. Seems to work extremely well for any situation in which we're measuring classical gravitational effects, okay? Even strong gravitational fields uh, like in black holes. So similarly, now someone has to give you an action for a Klein-Gordon scalar, okay? And one motivated choice is this action that we saw last time, but now written in the presence of a background metric. So not in flat space time, but with some arbitrary background metric, okay? So we'll write down that action. Okay, so the metric obviously appears over here, okay? Question is, does the metric, does the metric appear over here? This derivative uh, is of a scalar field, okay? So this derivative is just partial alpha phi, okay? Doesn't appear to depend on the metric, but there is a metric dependence hidden here because what I've secretly done is I've contracted these two derivatives, so that uses a metric, okay? So there is a metric dependence, okay, which is hidden in here, okay? So these derivatives don't really depend on the metric, but this G alpha beta does depend on the metric, okay? And of course, the square root minus G does depend on the metric. Okay, so now given this action, okay, what we want to do is construct the equation uh, we want to construct first the stress energy tensor. Okay. Uh, so when we do this, what we will get is so I'll pull up this p factor. 8 pi root minus g. So the first thing will give me minus half del uh, mu pi del mu pi, okay? This is the derivative of this term or this term with respect to g upper mu nu, okay? It sets alpha equal to mu, beta equal to nu, okay? Or vice versa, which is what cancels this factor of 2. So I'll actually cancel this factor of 2. This term doesn't depend on the metric, okay? So when I differentiate it, it's 0, okay? But now I also have the measure which depends on G, okay? So if I write this whole thing in shorthand, I write this as the Lagrangian of the scalar field times the measure. Okay? Uh, then what I will get as the second term in this differentiation is the Lagrangian of the scalar field times delta of square root minus g by delta g. Oh, sorry. Uh, this whole thing was multiplied by square root minus g as well. So th this is what we get. Um, and now this term, uh, we had already written down somewhere. Uh, so this term is equal to minus half square root of minus g times g. Okay. So plugging this in and then canceling this square root minus g in both places, we get minus 1 over 8 pi, uh, I'll pull out this minus sign as well, plus 1 over 8 pi, del mu pi, del mu pi, plus half g mu nu times the Lagrangian density which is just um, 
sorry, uh, I, sh I made a mistake, okay. There's still a factor of half here. Yeah, sorry, when I differentiate G alpha beta with respect to mu nu, I'm fixing the order of the indices, so this is just delta mu, uh, delta alpha mu, delta beta mu. Okay, so the half doesn't cancel out, okay, the half just stays there. Okay, so I have a half here and I have a half uh, g mu nu, this, this is the half which is coming from here and then I have a minus half coming from there, from that Lagrangian times del, uh, let me write it as alpha phi del alpha phi plus m square phi square. Okay. So pulling out a half common, I get 1 over 16 pi del mu phi del mu phi minus g mu mu Okay, so this is the stress energy tensor uh, for this Lagrangian. Okay, and our gravitational equation of motion now, so our full gravitational equation of motion is now g mu nu is 8 pi t mu nu. Okay, where t mu nu is this thing which depends on the scalar fields phi, but it also depends on the metric g mu nu, okay. But that's not something surprising, we've seen this before, right, when we wrote down the stress energy tensor in GR for a, for a perfect fluid, right, we had something like this, rho, um, rho plus P into U mu, U nu plus P G mu nu, right. So we're used to having a part of the stress energy tensor depending on the metric itself. Okay, this is for a perfect fluid. But here we sort of just wrote down the answer for what, what we should have for the stress energy tensor. Here we are able to derive, in, uh, today what we have done is we are able to derive the right hand side or the stress energy tensor of Einstein's equations starting with a matter Lagrangian. Uh, there is no integral in uh, this variation. Remember when we define the, the variation, right, what we are talking about is ds by d lambda is the integral delta s by delta g mu nu, delta g mu nu integral uh, over e, right. So this does not have the integral inside, okay. But this s does include that measure square root minus g, okay. So that is why I have kept the square root minus g inside, okay, when doing the, uh, uh, when differentiating this action, yeah. yeah. So usually we try and we can also construct the stress energy tensor using the symmetries also, right? Yeah, maybe I'll talk about that if there's time, otherwise I'll take it up in the discussion. So it's the same, we'll get the same expression. Uh, no, so actually, okay, so you might have seen a stress energy tensor constructed in field theory. Yeah. Okay, and that is constructed in a very specific case mm -hmm. of background being Minkowski space, mm -hmm. so that the metric is a flat metric, and you construct it for, uh, uh, basically you use a symmetry, you use translation invariance and you construct the Noether currents. Yeah. The Noether currents basically correspond to a stress energy, something called a stress energy tensor. That stress energy tensor uh, does not always match the stress energy tensor constructed by this method, okay. For the Klein-Gordon uh, field it would. For be. the Klein-Gordon field it does yeah. when I set the metric to the flat metric, okay. But it does not always necessarily do that. Moreover, there is no general such definition of a stress energy tensor in arbitrary space times because you may not have translation, translation invariance in those space times, okay. But this definition of a stress energy tensor always works, mm -hmm. okay, um, yeah. So that is why I was careful to call this the gravitational stress energy tensor, okay. Uh, something that I will leave as homework, okay, is to work out the equations of motion of 
phi from this Lagrangian. That's rather easy to do. We already did it in the case where G was the flat metric, okay? But you have to be a little careful because now you'll have a boundary term which you should show is zero. Okay, so when we set this condition, the equations of motion that you will get will be the, uh, the Klein-Gordon equation. But now you see something, okay? Uh, this is not, this is in a general background. Not necessarily equal to eta mu, okay? So here, what you're doing is, you are, uh, if you look at where the metric appears, del mu acting on phi again doesn't really have the metric because this is a scalar field. But this del mu is now acting on a vector field, okay? And th therefore now you have a metric dependence, okay, which, which will show up in this equation. Okay? And strictly speaking now, if we want to uh, work out the equations of motion, we are solving for the combination of the gravitational action plus the matter action. This is the total action. We extremize the total action with respect to all fields, the gravitational field, which is the metric, as well as the matter field, which is the scalar field phi. And we got two equations of motion. It's not one equation of motion, it's two equations of motion, this one and this one, okay? Where T mu nu was this stress energy tensor over here, okay? So it, it really follows uh, the principle of uh, general relativity, which is space-time, which is the metric, tells matter how to move, okay? Because it decides uh, the curvature, the rate of change of this phi, okay? And matter, which is this field phi, tells space-time how to curve, which is it sources the metric fluctuations, okay, or deviations of the metric from a flat metric. So this should be really thought of as the analog of when we had single particles, right? We wrote down just some kind of equation of motion like this, okay, for single particles. But U is associated because the particle is only located at a specific position at any time, right? It's not spread out over all of space-time. Fields are a little bit different because fields are spread out over all of space-time, okay? So here you only talked about a specific velocity vector associated with the location of the particle. Here we're talking about a field which is spread out over space-time, okay? Okay, yeah, and the other thing I, uh, which, which is important to know is that in practical situations, okay, it's typically imp almost impossible to solve these coupled equations together with some boundary conditions, okay? So typically you will never be able to solve these equations because these are coupled differential equations, okay, and coupled nonlinear differential equations. So it's very difficult to solve them together. So in practical situations, what you assume is you assume that there is, let's say, gravity plus there is um, uh, this scalar field plus maybe other sources, okay? And practically, Let's say that you assume these other sources give you some stress energy tensor. And you assume that this, these sources, okay, are much stronger than your scalar field that you're creating. And therefore, to a good approximation, they will fix the metric for you, okay? So what you do is you sometimes work with a fixed background metric, okay, where you assume that this metric is coming from some source, okay? And then you solve the equation of the motion of the scalar field in that background, okay? So that, that's only as a practical matter. But in principle, what you really have to do is vary everything. And now you have everything is coupled to everything. The metric leads to fluctuations in the scalar field. The scalar field leads to fluctuations in the metric. Both fluctuations or both uh, changes in these fields have to be solved for simultaneously. Yeah, okay. So one important property of the stress energy tensor
is that the stress energy tensor must be conserved, ok. That is, this should be true. Because if you look at it, uh, this derivative with respect, uh, sorry, uh, if I take the derivative of both sides of Einstein's equation, this is identically 0, ok, by the Bianchi identity, uh, the contracted Bianchi identity. Okay. So, therefore, this has, the, you need this to be true, but the question is that given an arbitrary Lagrangian, given an arbitrary matter Lagrangian, is it guaranteed that T mu nu will be divergenceless, okay, that is del mu T mu nu will vanish, okay. So, the question that we have is given an arbitrary action, S matter, will uh, and the answer is yes. Okay. As long as the matter action is diffeomorphism invariant. which is actually the only sensible way to define it, okay, is that you choose it to be diffeomorphism invariant. That is SM, uh, so I can treat SM as a function of the metric and phi, okay. So what do I mean by diffeomorphism invariant? So here is the manifold, there is a scalar field and there is a, uh, and there is a metric. And now I have a copy of this manifold. And I have a map which takes me from this manifold to its copy, okay. And this is assumed to be a smooth map. And now once, if this map F is a diffeomorphism, that is it also has an inverse, then it is always possible to push forward uh, all these fields from this manifold to, so for example, a point P might get mapped to a different point P prime here. But now using this uh, diffeomorphisms, okay, it is possible to push forward the metric which was at point P to get the new metric at the point P prime, okay, and to get the metric at, uh, and to get the scalar field at the point P prime, okay, starting with the fields phi P and G P over here, okay. This G P prime may not be the same as G P, okay, it, it, it may be a different uh, tensor, okay, it depends on how the diffeomorphism is transforming. But as long as I have this kind of map, okay, and this action is invariant under these diffeomorphisms, that is, if I look at the transformed phi and g, okay, so let me denote those by f star g, f star phi, okay. This is the push forward of g, okay, okay, let me, I, I don't know how many of you watch those lectures on these maps between manifolds. Strictly speaking, when you have a dual vector, can you push it forward with an arbitrary map, something that is a 0 n type tensor? Can you push it forward with an arbitrary smooth map, if you recall this? 0 n tensors can only be pulled back, okay, and an n 0 type tensors, that is vector type tensors can only be pushed forward, but when I have an inverse map, F inverse also exists, okay. So, I can use the inverse map to pull back G from here to here, okay. And I, and, and phi can of course just be pushed forward, okay. Phi of P prime will just be phi. Okay. So, strictly speaking, this is accomplished using uh, the pullback of F inverse, okay. Anyway, that is a detail which uh, we do not need for now, okay. But this is the statement of diffeomorphism invariance. If the action is diffeomorphism invariant, which uh, by any reasonable construction it should be, okay. If it is diffeomorphism invariant, then it is guaranteed that the stress energy tensor is divergenceless, okay. I will not prove this. The proof is given in uh, 
fault. It's, it's a rather easy proof, okay? Uh, but since we're running short of time, I'm not going to prove it. So, walled uh, appendix. Uh, I'm not sure which appendix this is, either D or E, whichever one talks about Lagrangians. Okay. Look, on Lagrangian formulation. So for now, by the way, I'm following a combination of Wald and uh, Nakahara, okay? A lot of this discussion is from Wald, including the Gibbons, Hawking, York term. Okay, we're running a bit short on time, so let me just say one more thing, which is, um, uh, so one thing that you can uh, do in GR, is if you take the action, the pure gravitational action, okay, without any matter fields. So you take the Einstein-Hilbert action uh, plus the gibbons hawking york boundary term, okay, where this was minus square root G times R, which I'll write explicitly as G mu nu R mu nu. Okay. And this action we regarded as a function of the metric, okay, a functional of the metric. Uh, and the way we thought of it was R mu nu depends on derivatives of G, okay. And these derivatives also depend on the metric because we chose these derivatives to be the metric compatible, the unique metric compatible derivatives. Remember on a manifold, you can choose any arbitrary derivative operator or affine connection, okay? And uh, if I had chosen a different one, delta twiddle, okay? Delta twiddle would be the difference between these two, okay, acting on some vector. Uh, the difference between these two would be a tensor. The difference between the two is a well-defined tensor. Um, so, for example, if I have, uh, so this would be something like schematically, okay? It's derivative minus Christoffel symbol V, okay? And this is a, a new connection, okay, which is not the metric compatible connection. And this is derivative of V minus metric compatible connection, okay? Uh, the, the gamma which is defined from the metric. And this is a tensor, okay? So what this means is gamma twiddle minus gamma or gamma, this is a tensor. Okay, so either in a coordinate dependent way you can look at these connection coefficients, okay? And the difference between two connection coefficients is a tensor. Or you can think about just the derivative operator itself, okay? And the difference between this derivative operator and the metric compatible derivative operator and think of that as a tensor, okay? So I can regard this as a function of two fields. I can, if I choose the derivative in here to not be the metric compatible connection, but rather it differs from the metric compatible connection by some amount, okay? So instead of choosing deltas in here, I choose delta twiddles, okay? And delta twiddle is different from delta by a tensor, okay, which I can write as, it's a delta gamma, okay. So I treat this as a function of G and this new connection, delta twiddle, okay. So instead of treating it as a function of G and delta which is determined by G, I treat it as a function of del twiddle. And del twiddle can be thought of as being defined by this tensor delta gamma, okay? And what you can do now is, so now my derivatives are no longer defined by just my traditional uh, metric compatible derivative, okay? These are these arbitrary uh, derivatives, but I'm still assuming torsion free, okay? Torsion free derivatives. What you can show, again, I'm not going to show this, is that if I vary the action, 
okay, with respect to both G as well as with respect to this tensor delta gamma, okay. Then I will get two equations of motion, I will get one for the metric and I will get one for the connection, sorry, uh, this is bad notation. Um, I should call this, let us say, the difference between two gammas. And now I am varying the difference between the two gammas, okay. So this is with respect to delta gamma, this is a tensor. And this is a variation of that tensor. So now I have two equations of motion, okay, one for G and one for delta gamma, okay. The amazing thing is that what you will find is when you set, when you look at this equation of motion for the change in the connection, what you will find is that the change in connection is exactly zero, okay. Which means that the equation of motion tells you that the connection gamma twiddle is really just the metric compatible connection, okay. So the equation of motion is basically telling you that even though you started with an arbitrary gamma twiddle, okay, the choice of gamma twiddle that extremizes the action is the one where gamma twiddle is equal to gamma, okay. That is where you, you are forced to pick the metric compatible connection among all possible connections that you could have chosen on the manifold. It is only the metric compatible one that actually extremizes the action, okay. And then of course once this is true, this just gives you usual equations of motion, g mu nu is 0. But since these must be simultaneously satisfied, this, is, this now has metric compatible connections inside it. Okay. Now, the book is not clear on this, but I think this is no longer true if I add matter and if I use derivatives in the matter which are not metric compatible, okay. So if I use non-metric compatible derivatives, then I have to vary the matter action also with respect to those delta gammas and I do not think I will get the same equation of motion anymore, okay. So it is only in the gravitational part that I can use an arbitrary connection, okay. And the equation of motion will tell me that if I want to extremize the equation of motion, okay, then uh, I basically set this, sorry, I basically set the connection to the, uh, the standard uh, metric compatible connection, okay. So that is a, a rather beautiful result, right, because uh, on a manifold we know that we are allowed to have many connections. It is somewhat arbitrary to pick out the metric compatible connection, okay. But the equations of motion here are telling you that you must pick out the metric compatible connection, okay. All right. So Kabir had asked a question about um, the, the standard stress energy tensor which we construct in Minkowski space using translation invariance and the connection between that and the gravitational stress energy tensor. I think that is a good thing to take up in discussion. We probably would not have time for it uh, in the regular lecture. Any other questions? Okay, so we meet next Friday, okay, at 5.30 and we will have a discussion section.